Are you tired of not doing the things you need to do? Frustrated by not living up to your potential? It's a new year, the season of making life-changing resolutions that last till about Valentine's Day. A time to binge watch YouTube videos on productivity and efficiency and leadership and that perfect weight training routine to shape you into the epitomized figure of health and strength. Hi, this is Derek and I'm a verbal process. I watched a collection of productivity videos by the Better Ideas YouTube channel recently. Better Ideas publishes videos to help make a more effective and less boring you. However, upon implementing the advice in the video called Why Your Life is So Boring, I found that author C.S. Lewis and other thinkers challenge Better Ideas, ideas to go further in living an effective life today. The five minute video starts off by claiming that we think of our life as a story, a narrative structure, and we reflect on the past while we hope for an ideal future. The next main point is that life is not a highlight reel. Social media, the things that we see on it, they're highlights. They're not life in and of itself as we experience it on a daily basis. And these highlights start to influence the story we tell ourselves about our own lives better ideas, quotes. Boring is a day with suboptimal highlights or no highlights at all, which leads to a sense of failure. The truth is that no one lives like this. Celebrities, their days consist of grinding and grit and struggle, doing things they would rather not do. The next point in the better ideas video is that we live a 16 hour episode called a day. And really our life is a series of these 16 hour episodes. He paints one picture called the depressing life in which we don't like the things that we do and we dread the day. We fantasize the future still waiting to live our real lives. And on the other hand, he creates a silver lining or what he calls the 16 hour episode. 16 hours is a manageable time to perfect, he claims. He goes on by saying it's a day when our system was running. We gave life a good shot. Quote, we did the little things that make us happy. For example, a conversation with a good friend, learning how to cook, establishing one positive habit at a time. Being grounded and happy with elevated mood becomes an automatic thing. This micro scale view creates clarity of daily choices. We say yes today and really our life is today repeated. My thoughts initially upon watching this video a couple times is that the first parts are quite practical and correct. Life is a story. That's how we live our life. We have all of this information and all of these details that we could never process in how we're made up. And so we turn things into a narrative structure with highly condensed information in symbols and in plot and in story. Spot on. The next one too is that this is a very important message that, that social media is a series of highlights and really social media guys it's equivalent to icing on a cake icing isn't the substance and nor are the highlights that we see on social media the fullness of life however the last section left me unsatisfied the results or answering the why and maybe it's the critic in me but I ask myself, why bother? Or what's the point of going through all of these New Year's resolutions that I have? I mean, what's the point of going to the gym when I'd rather sip hot cocoa next to my fireplace or wake up every morning before six without pressing the snooze button or of, of making claims that I'm going to contact my relatives at least a certain amount of times per week these are things that I don't want to do. However, he's calling me to do this. And if I want to live a fulfilled life, I need to be able to do the things that I 
set a goal to do that I feel are right, that are a part of my values within this 16 hour frame we call a day. But what's the point? You know, that nihilistic whisper comes in. It's like, why bother? Nonetheless, I decided to implement the advice that he carried out in this video and a few others. In the video, we can see that he checks off each day that he completed the task of forming his good habit. And his example was reading a book. Currently, I'm reading C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. And I thought, you know what? I haven't read my book today. And in this 16-hour episode, I'm going to check that off. I'm going to read my book. So I picked up reading where I left off, which is the last chapter called The Practical Conclusion, which is the climax of Lewis' argument. He so carefully lays out one step at a time. So starting on page 62, and if you have your book, please turn there. Just kidding. Starting on the second paragraph, sentence two, C.S. Lewis writes, your natural life is derived from your parents. That does not mean it will stay there if you do nothing about it. You can lose it by neglect or you can drive it away by committing suicide. You have to feed it your natural life, that is. You have to look after it. But always remember, you are not making it. You're only keeping up a life you got from someone else. Pause there. So what do we see here so far? C.S. Lewis is painting a picture that the natural life is something that we receive from our parents. Just like our body of matter we receive from the earth. Interesting fact that the top 13 elements that comprise the human body are also the top 13 elements that are in soil. Then you ask, okay, so what about the spark of life? Where does that come from? Or consciousness, these things that we receive, what are we that we don't receive? Fair questions. He also makes the claim that if you don't use it, you'll lose it. If you don't take care of or maintain or facilitate your natural life that you received, you're going to lose it, as in you're going to crumble and fall apart and die, or you might commit suicide. We must feed and nurture the life that we received. At this point, better ideas would agree. And C.S. Lewis is, interestingly, this passage seems to be in the about section of the Better Ideas channel. It reads, helping you live a more effective life. And at this point, I, I ask, is it the right word, this effective word? What does it really mean? Well, the definition of effective is successful in producing a desired or intended result. The Better Ideas philosophy really reminds me of Stephen Pressfield's philosophy of resistance. And Pressfield describes resistance as that which stands between us and our unlived life and potential selves. So how do we defeat the internal self-sabotage of resistance that rises its head and tries to attack our attempts of effectiveness or, or productivity? And really, how do we live an effective life? Well, let's continue reading C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. In the same way, a Christian can lose the Christ life, which has been put into him. And he has to make efforts to keep it, that is, to keep the Christ life. But even the best Christian that ever lived is not acting on his own steam. He is only nourishing or protecting a life he could never have acquired by his own efforts. And that has practical consequences. As long as the natural life is in your body, it will do a lot towards repairing that body. Cut it, and up to a point it will heal, as a dead body would not. A live body is not one that never gets hurt, but one that can, to some extent, repair itself. In the same way, a Christian is not a man who never goes wrong, but a man who is enabled to repent and pick himself up and begin over again after each stumble, because the Christ life is inside him, repairing him all the time, 
enabling him to repeat, in some degree, the kind of voluntary death which Christ himself carried out. Let's pause there. What propels us to improve, to change, to, to realize our potential? Well, Lewis would argue that it would be what he calls the Christ life, or the energy of Christ in you, plus the Holy Spirit of God working in and through you in order to fashion you into the likeness and identity of Christ. The same principle in the spiritual is also seen as in the natural. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So if you don't care for this spiritual life that you inherited, then you're going to lose it or it'll uh, come to some sort of spiritual death. We are reshaped by a process of repairing and repenting, C.S. Lewis would say. And this re word repenting, really what's behind it is the Greek word metanoia. That is to, to change one's mind or to do a 180 or, uh, as the Apostle Paul would write, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's what's happening with metanoia or the word repenting. So repairing, repenting, and repeating Christ's voluntary death to the old self. So what's the difference between what C.S. Lewis is talking about and what the Better Ideas video is talking about? Let's pick it up, page 63, paragraph 2. That is why the Christian is in a different position from other people who are trying to be good or effective or productive. They hope by being good to please God if there is one, or if they think there is not, at least they hope to deserve approval from good men. But the Christian thinks any good he does comes from the Christ life inside him. He does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. I'll say that last sentence again. He does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. Just as the roof of a greenhouse does not attract the sun because it is bright, but becomes bright because the sun shines on it. And let me make it quite clear, C.S. Lewis continues, that when Christians say the Christ life is in them, they do not mean simply something mental or moral. When they speak of being in Christ or of Christ being in them, this is not simply a way of saying that they are thinking about Christ or copying him. They mean that Christ is actually operating through them, that the whole mass of Christians are the physical organism through which Christ acts, that we are his fingers and muscles, the cells of his body. I'm going to stop there because I don't want to give away the climax of this chapter, which is really the resolution of this entire section of his book, Mere Christianity. So what's happening here? Lewis seems to be addressing better ideas directly again. What propels us according to better ideas? Well, that would be one's own will or strength or grit, diligence. And for what purpose? Well, according to better ideas video, to be balanced and happy with an elevated mood. Well, Lewis responds that, or continues upon what Better Ideas is describing and says that really it's, it's either to please God and or to please other people. And as we continue reading the second part of this last patches that I read, what Lewis is describing is this element of the Christ life working through us. Uh, it could also be described as the Logos, or logos, that's abiding and working through people. What's, the logos is often translated as word. David Bentley Hart, in his translation of the New Testament in John chapter 5, has a footnote on the word logos. And he writes, that logos is a mediating divine principle through whom the invisible and silent God is seen and heard. That is, that God works through through the word, through the expression of who he, he is. 
And that's what's happening inside of the Christian that invites God to, to work through this mediating principle. I hope that helps explain it. That God will make us good because he loves us, C.S. Lewis writes. And that would be the difference between what Lewis is talking about or really expressing what Christianity would be proposing and that which is proposed by better ideas. Okay. The last little bit that I can read to you from this section and what he leaves his readers with is now, today, this moment is our chance to choose. So really he's calling upon this action of today being the day of decision or what the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Okay, so I checked off the book. So far, so good. The next thing was having an inbox bin that starts stacking higher and higher. I don't know if you guys have this, but I find it to be a point of resistance against my productivity that I'll just stick it into this inbox uh, pile and I'll get to it later. And sometimes I just really don't get to it. And the narrative of life continues along with its plot line and I never really get to everything that I say I will. But it's a new year and I'm changing that right now. So in that inbox was a bulletin that I received from a church that I visited in Santa Rosa, California. And the church is called St. Ser Seraphim of Serov. It's an Orthodox church, English speaking. It's wonderful people, wonderful service. I was pleased to be a guest. And I read the first part of the bulletin, which is a good sized bulletin, four full pages. Not like the half C page, but full letter size pages. And I turned to page three, and this is the passage that I picked up where I left off on. And I'll read it to you now. The heading is The Need for a Sense of Urgency. And the passage is from a book called Unseen Warfare. Remind yourself every day that now is in your hands, but tomorrow is in the hands of God. And that he who gave you this morning has not bound himself with the promise to give you the evening too. Refuse to listen to the devil when he whispers to you, give me now and you will give tomorrow to God. No, no. Spend all the hours of your life in a way pleasing to God. Keep in your mind the thought that after the present hour, you will not be given another, and that you will have to render a strict account for every minute of this present hour. Remember that the time you have in your hands is priceless, and if you waste it uselessly, the hour will come when you will seek and not find it. Consider as lost day when, although performing good deeds, you have not struggled to overcome your bad tendencies and desires. To end my lesson on this subject, I shall repeat the Apostle's commandment. Fight the good fight, as it is written in 1 Timothy. Always. For one hour of diligent work has often gained heaven, and one hour of negligence has lost it. Take care if you want to prove before God your firm faith in your salvation. Then he quotes, to end this passage, Proverbs, He that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. <laughs> As in he won't be skinny and starving to death. He will be nourished. Okay, again, this passage seems to fit right into the better ideas topic at hand and what C.S. Lewis uh, expands upon. And it drives home this idea of today, especially the passage on how the devil will whisper, or that is the accuser or slander will whisper inside of us into our ear and say, give me today because you will give God tomorrow. And of course, what happens in that exchange? The devil always gets, he always gets you, he gets what you are offering. You end up serving 
the devil because what happens to tomorrow, it becomes today. And you give today to the devil and then you say, well, tomorrow I'll give it to God, but tomorrow becomes today and you repeat this process and nothing gets done. And you end up serving your devices and passions and lusts and addictions. Everything that drags you down, that's what the devil wants. This Unseen Warfare book is called The Spiritual Combat and Path to Paradise of Lorenzo Scupoli. Originally written by Scupoli, who is a 16th century Venetian priest in the church in the West. It was later edited and translated by Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, who's a, a Greek Orthodox, and then later by Theophan the Recluse, who's a Russian aesthetic. So pretty interesting group of editors and writers that produced this, this work called Unseen Warfare. It's described as a guide to perfection and a stripping away of all that militates against it. So in a, the Christian idea of perfection or, or wholeness, or as uh, in chapter 5 and 6 of, of the Sermon on the Mount, book of Matthew, Jesus is saying that be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This idea of perfection, it's, it's the goal of Christ having full work in us and us partnering completely with what God's doing in and through the Christian. And really, you're stripping away everything that militates against it. There's icons and the picture of angels trying to draw us up heavenly towards the attributes and the being of God. And then devils, be it our, our tendencies to hate or to divide or our addictions and lusts, they drag us down towards the torment of hell. So we're trying to strip away all of those things and, and really everything that militates against it. Awfully similar to Pressfield's idea of resistance here. Okay, back to the Better Ideas video. I want to leave you with my final comments. Firstly, Better Ideas is really correct in that individuals live out a story. But it doesn't need to stop there, nor does it. The narrative structure of life expands from the first level of individuality outward. So, for example, groups of people all having their own individual stories can participate in a collective story. Think about it. Your family, your household, they have a story that everybody contributes to like uh, say a bloodline or a legacy. We are the millers. We are they who mills wood. <laughs> but a more practical, practical example is, oh yeah, so the Fiedlers, they're known for their service in the community or having a high regard for technical things or being good mechanics or um, they have a legacy of working in the ministry or whatever it may be. It could be servicing bicycles. There's many individuals participating in what that family legacy is known for. I mean, think of in media, the, the Sopranos. What comes to mind? What characteristics? What values that you think of the Sopranos or the Kardashians or the Graham family, Billy Graham and his sons and daughters and their kids? Neighborhoods can have a collective identity. Yeah, that part of town's known for being a rough part of town, or that neighborhood is known for getting it done and throwing block parties. Think of the causes or the clubs that you're a part of. All of these things transcend the individual story. They have a start, they have a genesis, and they have a life and uh, what they're known for and their values. And oftentimes they have a resolution, they come to a close. And this scales even further. Think of the, the nation. You know, our nation had a, a birth in the revolution and the founding fathers who laid the value system that we're carrying out in the life of this nation. And probably one day, the United States isn't going to be anymore and it will have a death as well. And we could tell the story of our nation in five minutes. 
you know, the infinite amount of details and information that goes into what's happened in the last 300 or so years can be consolidated and compacted so densely into being described in a five minute story. This is how human consciousness perceives the world. Christianity invites us, it invites you to participate in the story of all stories, that is the story of ultimate reality or what we call the great story. Because what's beyond the story of a nation, Christians really believe that the symbolism expands even further and even larger and beyond that God has a story and that we play one small part in the story that transcends all of the individual stories. Any amount of improvement of productivity or efficacy on your part is to help you better play your part for the edification of the great story or our history is really his story, the author of the story of stories. My second point in closing is that C.S. Lewis and Scupali and the other people that I mentioned in this video really state that becoming a better, more effective person is not the goal of Christianity, although it can be a byproduct. We can allow who we were to die so the Christ life can dwell in us to fashion who we truly are and were created to be. This life or spirit prepares us for the mode of being appropriate for the age to come. Any happiness or productivity is again a byproduct in the greater goal of the Christ life and in the greater story. Brother Lawrence wrote, do not be discouraged by the resistance you will encounter from your human nature. You must go against your human inclinations. Often in the beginning, he's, again, he's telling a story, you will think that you are wasting time, but you must go on. Be determined and preserve in it until death, despite all the difficulties. Do all things as unto the Lord today. And in this, your day will be everything but boring. Productivity offers one part of the process of one's pursuit of perfection or wholeness through the Christ life and the stripping away of all that militates against it as efficacy is one part of thousands of elements comprising one's personhood an individual's life is one part in the great story or one cell in the body of Christ. Happy New Year, and may you have a profitable, productive, beneficial, proactive year this year, accomplishing your goals and really fulfilling the life that you were called to live and becoming the person that you can fully realize in all of your potential. If you'd like to support the channel, you can click subscribe to be notified of future videos, click the like button, tell a friend, post it on social media, get the word out there. If you'd like to contribute financially, you can do so with the PayPal link in the description below. Also, I added a wish list to Amazon and thriftbooks.com of books and research materials that I will use to further the work that's being done here. So for example, Unseen Warfare, the book that I quoted from, that book is in the Amazon wish list as well as the thriftbook.com wish list. So click that link in the description below. Thank you for watching.